Okay, this is the third marking period uh, exam review. So make sure you've got your calculator, make sure you have a, a reference table, and uh, here we go. It's a little bit of everything. Which temperature change indicates an increase in the average kinetic energy of the molecules in the sample? Average kinetic energy is our key for temperature. So we want an increase in temperature. So first of all, I have a whole bunch of different temperature scales. I have Kelvin and Celsius. We need to make them all the same. So here we are on table T. The conversion between Kelvin and Celsius is adding 273 to anything Kelvin. So let's go back and let's make everything Kelvin. So 15 plus 273 is 288. So 288 to 298 is a decrease. Sorry, whoa. <laughs> 288 to what, one, 298 is, um, that is an increase. That's probably our answer. But let's just make sure. Zero, this is 273. So that goes down. 37 plus 273 is 310. So that goes down. And 25 plus 273 is 298. That goes down. So yes, you want the increase. How many decimal places should be in the answer if 2.214 is added to 6.3? So the rule with addition and subtraction is the fewest number of total decimal places. So this has three decimal places, fewest number of total decimal places. This is one. So it's not asking for the answer. It's just saying how many should be in the answer, and it is one. When 1.255 grams of X reacts completely with 3.2 grams of Y, Z is the only product. What is the total mass? Okay, so total means adding. So 1.255 plus 3.2 gives me 4.455 according to my calculator. But when we go to the ref, uh, sig figs, you want one decimal place. So here's my one decimal place. This rounds it up to 4.5. So choice C. One kilojoule <coughs> is the same as. Okay, so back to the reference tables, right on the front is when we have our prefixes. Kilo is 10 to the third, which means a thousand times larger. 10 to the third is a thousand. So a thousand times larger than our base unit. And our base unit would be, you know, a meter, a gram, a pascal, a kelvin, or any of that. I, although I haven't really seen a millikelvin or any of that. So kilojoules are big, <coughs> which means they'd have a large amount of joules, a thousand joules. <clears throat> Which Kelvin temperature is equal to 56 degrees Celsius? We just did that. Add 273 and you get 329 Kelvin, positive 329. Um, a lab experiment was performed to determine the percent by mass of water in a hydrate. The accepted value is 36%. Which observed value has an error of five? So the formula, table T, uh, here we go. So percent error is measured value over, uh, sorry, subtracting accepted, divided by accepted times 100. Make sure it's always positive and your units are percent sign. So <clears throat> we we're looking for 5% error. So if you have 31%, 36 minus 31 is 5, divided by 36 times 100. This is going to give you 13.89%. That's not what we want. 30, uh, 36 minus 36, that's 0% error. 37.8 minus 36 is 1.8 divided by 36 times 100. That's our answer. This gives me the 5%, choice C. What is the total number of joules of heat energy absorbed by 15 grams of water when it's heated from 30 to 40 degrees Celsius? So back to our reference tables, the heat formulas. When there's a delta T, a change in temperature, we're going to use Q equals MC delta T, where Q is heat in joules, M is mass. Specific heat capacity, if it's water, which I believe it is, <coughs> we use this value right here, 4.18 joules per gram degrees Celsius or Kelvin, and then our delta T is T final minus T initial. So back here. So joules of heat, M, C, and I know it's 4.18 because it said water. Delta T is T final minus T initial. So that's 10. So 15 times 4.18 times 10 
gives you 627. That's not a choice here, so I go with the two sig figs, which is choice D. <clears throat> Sample X is passed through a filter paper. A white residue Y remains on the paper, and a clear liquid Z passes through. When liquid Z is vaporized, another white residue remains. So what is sample X? Well, um, it can't be an element or a compound because we're trying to separate it physically. So if you have residue remaining, that means you've got differences. That would be heterogeneous mixtures. If it was a homogeneous mixture, it would, everything would just filter through. Which mixture can be separated using the equipment below? So again, we've got table salt. This is sand. This is table salt aqueous. This is a, a sugar solution. And we've got dissolved carbon dioxide. So if you want to separate something using a filter, you have to have solids. So it's got to be choice A. <clears throat> got to be choice A. If a student pours a mixture of sand and salt water through a filter paper into a beaker, what will be found in the beaker after filter? So in the beaker means coming through the filter. So the salt water is homogeneous mixture. That will come through, all of it, the salt and the water. The sand will remain. A mixture of sand and salt can be separated by filtration because the substances difference in, differ in solubility in water. The salt will dissolve in water, so it will pass through the filter. The sand won't dissolve in water, so it'll stay. Okay, an ion that has seven protons, six neutrons, and 10 electrons has a net charge of. Okay, so we're looking for only charged particles, which means neutrons are gone. Protons are positive and electrons are negative. So if you've got seven positives and 10 negatives, that means overall negative. How much more negative? By a factor of three. Okay, um, what is the mass is the smallest? So the mass of these particles is on table O. So we're talking neutron. The mass of a neutron is up here, 1 AMU. Mass of a proton is up here, 1 AMU. Mass of electron is essentially the beta particle, is zero. Technically, it's 1 over 1836 of an AMU, but zero is what the Regents is. Okay, so those, that's where you're looking for your uh, masses here. Two electrons is still zero. The mass of two neutrons would be two. The mass of one electron plus the mass of one proton, that doesn't matter, so this is one AMU. One neutron plus one electron, again, that doesn't matter, so two neutrons is the most massive. Oh! <laughs> Except, that's not what they want. They want the smallest mass, which would be the mass of two electrons. See, that's why I wouldn't get 100 on the regions, because I don't read. Or listen, I guess. Subatomic particles can usually pass undeflected through an atom, because the volume of an atom is composed of mostly empty space. That was Rutherford's gold foil experiment. Atomic number of any atom is equal to the number of protons only. Yes, you might have some examples when you also have the same number of um, neutrons, which is the same, but they don't have to be the same. What is the mass number of an atom that contains 19 protons, 19 electrons, and 20 neutrons? So essentially, electrons don't have mass. So mass number is the sum of protons and neutrons. So 19 plus 20 gives me 39. Isotopes must have the same identity, which comes from atomic number, protons. What is different is atomic mass due to number of neutrons, but they're asking for what is the same, which would be um, number, of new, number of protons. Okay, uh, isotopes of the same element. So that's not the same element. That's not the same element. Okay, so A and B are the same element. However, B just shows the same mass, same number of protons. That's not it. So in part A, you have the same number of protons, which is 50, but you have a different mass number, which means you have different numbers of neutrons, which means those are isotopes. The maximum number of electrons that a single orbital in the 3D sublevel may contain. Okay, well, that's the key, single orbital. So it really doesn't even matter that it says 3D. How many can fit in a single orbital? Two. Which orbital notation correctly represents a noble gas in the ground state? Noble gases have full outer shells or full orbitals. So who is full? Choice C. The atoms of a sample of an element are in excited states. A bright line spectrum is produced when these atoms 
Hmm. Now, it has nothing to do with positrons. Do you see the spectrum when you absorb energy or when you emit? It's emit. You have to absorb energy to get to the excited state. And then you get go down to the ground and you give off the colors. So in order to get to the excited state, you have to absorb. If 20 milliliters of a 4 molar NaOH solution is exactly neutralized by 20 milliliters of HCl, what is the molarity? So this is dilution. Uh, molarity 1, volume 1, equals molarity 2. Uh, oh, sorry. This is the base side. It doesn't matter. Um, I guess I can do it this way. So it looks like the formula is, I don't know, and 20. Whoops, 20. Okay, so 20 milliliters. Looks like we have the same volume. Hmm, the same volume. So if you have the same volume, you're going to have the same molarity. So, well, D, not 4. You can do the math if you want. Which one molar solution has a pH greater than 7? So you're looking for bases. Um, so back over here on the reference tables, bases are on table L. So take a look for any of those here. Um, so if you're looking on table L, choice D is there. This is a covalent compound, sugar. This is tricky. That is acetic acid. It's on table K. This is a salt. What is the GFM of this? So I'm going to have 3 times whatever calcium is. 3. 2 times whatever phosphorus is. And 8 times whatever oxygen is. Okay? So unfortunately, my periodic table is sideways. But I need calcium, phosphorus, and oxygen. So calcium, the mass is 40.08. I'm going to call that 40. Phosphorus is 30.9, I'm going to call that 31, and 15.9, I'm going to call that 16. So you take your masses from periodic table. So 40, so 40 times 3 is 120. Um, phosphorus is 31, so 62, and 16 times 8 is 128. So let's add them up. And you get 310 grams per mole. Just add it up. But make sure you uh, distribute. A substance has an empirical formula of CH2 and a molecular mass of 56 grams per mole. What is the molecular formula? So what you need to do is figure out what's the GFM of your empirical. So this is 12, and this is 2 times 1, so 2. So 14 is the most basic, and I have 56. So 56 divided by 14 gives me a factor of 4. What do I do with this 4? I'm going to multiply the subscript. So C4H8 when I multiply subscripts. Which compound is the percent composition by mass of chlorine equal to 42%? So I know the total. So now I just need to look for the mass of chlorine itself. So if you look that up, it says, I think, 35. Yep, 35. So 35 is our mass of part. They give us our different masses of holes, and then we're going to times 100. So 35 divided by 52 times 100 gives me 67% for the first one. 35 divided by 68 times 100 is 51%. Nope. 84, sorry. 35 divided by 84 times 100 is 41.6%, which is 42, which means that's our answer. Don't need to keep going. What is the empirical formula of a compound that contains blah, blah, blah? Okay, so first thing you need to do is change them to grams. And then you need to divide by GFM to get moles. So I don't want to keep flipping back to my periodic table in the, in the document. So I'm just, you can hear me moving the pages to find periodic table here. So... I'm going to divide 28 by the GFM of uh, iron, which is 56. I'm going to get 0.5 moles of iron. Then I'm going to go do 24 divided by the mass of sulfur, which is 32. I'm going to get 0.75 moles of sulfur. And I'm going to do 48 divided by the mass of oxygen, which is 16. I'm going to get 3 moles. So now that I have our moles, I divide each by the smallest, which is 0.5. So this is going to be 1. 
0.75 divided by 5 is going to be 1.5, and 3 divided by 0.5 is going to be 6. So because it ends in 0.5, I'm going to have to double everything. So I'm going to get F2, Fe2, S3O12. That is not written here, but if you distribute, that's how you do that one. 27 is D. Okay, um, another one, Ugh. sorry, percent, so make these grams, so 46.7 divided by the mass of nitrogen, which is 14, so that's going to be 3.33 moles nitrogen, 53 point, I can't read that, 3, 53.3 divided by the mass of oxygen is 16, so, oh look, it's the same. So it's going to be a one-to-one -one molar ratio, so N-O. Very good. Very good to me. Um, percent composition by mass. So it gave me the whole thing, so that's what my um, denominator. Uh, but it's asking for nitrogen. This is how they get you. There's two of them, so 14 times 2 is 28. 28 divided by 96 times 100 gives me 29.1. 29.16, which is 29.2, and it rounds. All right, given the balanced equation representing a reaction, which type of chemical reaction is this? So I have one singleton and a singleton coming together to form one compound. Coming together, that's called a synthesis reaction. What is the formula of the missing compound? So let's take a look. I have a hydrocarbon and oxygen, CO2 and H2O. This is a combustion. Oh my gosh, it told me. I didn't even need to do that. Um, we got a balanced equation. What is the total mass of water formed when eight grams of hydrogen reacts completely with 64 grams of oxygen? Okay, so we're looking for mass to mass stoichiometry. So eight grams hydrogen divided by GFM is, oh, sorry, H2, is four moles hydrogen times, uh, now that I'm at moles, I can do my um, conversion factor, which is I seek water, so that's a two, seek over no. I know I'm using hydrogen, so that's also a two. So that's the same, so four moles water times the GFM of water, which is 18, so four times 18 is 72. At STP, one liter of helium contains the same number of This is uh, Avogadro's hypothesis, which states if you have a gas with the same temperature, volume, and pressure, which this is temperature and pressure, and that's volume, you're going to have the same number of atoms in the same volume. So there you go. How strongly an atom attracts to the, attract to the electrons? It's called E electronegativity. Based on electronegativity values, which has the greatest attraction for electrons in a bond? So just take a look. Take a look at table S uh, if you didn't know. And you've got, again, it's to the side, but all the electronegativities here. And if you just, you know, take a couple. Um, take a couple um, metals, a couple nonmetals, whatever. Noble gases will have none. So then when I, if I did look at it, it would be nonmetals. The arrangement of particles is most ordered in what? So ordered means low entropy. Uh, it would be the solid because they're all packed together like this. Uh, this is Avogadro's hypothesis again. You've got 12 liters, so we want 12 liters. Yes, I know that they're different substances, different masses, but the volumes are good. Another crystalline structure, that would have to be a solid. Uh, the temperature is constant, so this is P1V1 over T1 combined gas law, which is on table T, but then it said that the temperature is constant, so I can just get rid of that. So then uh, this is Bo uh, Charles, sorry, Boyle's law, you didn't need to know that, but if you say um, the the, if the volume increases, pressure will have to decrease, so that would be A. Okay, uh, CO2 solid and CO2 gas, what's going to be different? It has to be physical properties because the molecular structure of CO2 is always going to look like this. 
Chemical composition is the same and empirical form is the same. Which can be decomposed by chemical means? Anything that's an element sure as heck cannot. Octane is C8H18. Yeah, that's definitely it. If you're, you, this is a compound, you need a compound. Which describes the shape and volume of an aluminum cylinder at STP. So aluminum cylinder, that's a solid, definite, definite. So that would be A. Chemical changes change the actual bonding structure. When ice melts, it's still H2O. When, I, when water boils, it's still H2O. When ice sublimes, that's H2O solid to H2O gas. Decomposing water would mean H2O becoming H2 and O2, breaking of bonds, rearranging things. Um, so we've got, a, again, a temperature change. So this is Q equals MC delta T that we've talked about already. So 49.5, specific heat capacity of water, uh, in front of the reference table. T final, 66, minus T initial, 22, is going to be 44. So 44 times 4.18 times 49.5 gives me, holy crap, 9104. That's a lot. So 1, 2, 3, so 9.1 times 10 to the third. Cooling curve. Um, during which time interval does it exist as both a liquid and a solid? So again, we're cooling down. So this is gas, this is liquid, this is solid. So the phase change between liquid and solid is here. That's between minutes seven and nine. Increasing entropy is increasing disorder. So solid to liquid to gas. So liquid water, yeah, B. Ideal gas is the beach, so high temperature, low pressure. So the highest temperatures and the lowest pressures. Um, the attractive forces, uh, motion and attractive forces of ideal gas is a random straight line motion and no attractive forces. Uh, which would have another Avogadro's hypothesis? Three liters. Um, this is combined gas law, which I'm going to do down here. So it says um, 300 Kelvin. It has a pressure of 240 kilopascal. By the way, combined gas law, table T. Uh, 70 milliliters, and then over here we're going to have 150, and we're going to have 160 kilopascals and X. So we're going to cross multiply. Oh my goodness, no! Drop my pencil. 240 times 70 times 150 gives me 252, 1, 2, 3, 4. 300 times 160. 48000 times x. So 2520000 divided by 48000 gives me 52.5. That's not what I was supposed to get. I got 52.5. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong one. There we go. Got time for one more and then I'm going to have to pause. Um, this is, let's see, total pressure of 200 kilopascal, eight moles of nitrogen, two moles of oxygen, gas. Um, yeah, we're going to pause right here. Thank you. I'll be right back.